Welcome back to Catholic Reboot. This is um, Quo Vadis Part 2. And uh, where we left off was just a discussion of um, uh, Christ uh, declaring his church, right? So uh, the reason I started uh, this series uh, was there's actually two reasons. One, my father asked me to. Uh, he also gave me a book by Father Arnold uh, Damon, who was a Jesuit, which is somewhat I ironic in that the Jesuits uh, later in the 1960s created this new uh, form of theology uh, called liberation theology. So uh, poor Father uh, Damon is probably turning in his grave over that. But the name of his book was The One True Church and the Church or the Bible, which is a, it was a very good read. Uh, I did uh, take some of uh, some of what uh, uh, Father Damien had said, but I wanted to make this my own. The second reason was uh, today, which is uh, April 18th, and I hate to date my uh, my episodes because uh, some people look at it as well. That's an old episode. Why listen to it? But uh, more importantly, it's the uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, and so. Uh, the Gospel of St. John, which was 10, uh, 7 through 14, uh, we hear uh, what Christ had said. And he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf caveth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Right? So what's important is it's almost as if Christ um, was predicting what would happen 1,500 years later. Right? So uh, he, he basically was saying, be careful, right? Giving the warning, be careful uh, who's to come. Now, I want to transition a little bit and, and just discuss uh, the Catholic funeral mass. So I don't know if many of you have seen this, but during a funeral mass, when uh, a Catholic faithful are brought in uh, with the casket, their, uh, their feet are facing the tabernacle. And the reason for that is if they were to rise up out of the casket, they would be facing the tabernacle, right? Which basically symbolizes they'll be judged by Christ because the tabernacle has, uh, has the holy sacrifice of the mass or the body of Christ, all right? But when a priest uh, is brought into the church, his feet are facing the faithful or the pews. And the reason for that is that uh, if he were to rise up out of the casket, he would be facing the people and would first be judged by the people before being judged by Christ. Now you would say, well, how, how can people judge anyone? Well, the idea is, was he a good shepherd or was he a hireling, right, according to the gospel? So um, even Pope Gregory uh said that he was he feared this because of course he was a priest of the church and how would he be judged for the way he directed the faithful right so whenever a protestant attacks a priest as just a man understand that when christ instituted his church and instituted the priesthood he made a, a higher requirement of those that were leading the faithful Okay, so they have a, a huge responsibility. So that's why we we're taught never to attack a priest, right? It's almost sinful to attack a priest because they represent Christ's teaching. Therefore, they're representing Christ here on earth, okay? So they're not just a mere person once they receive the holy orders of priesthood. But Christ isn't saying to those uh, that... that uh, have lost the faith. So those um, Protestants 
that left his church be damned. What he is saying as the good shepherd, he will he wants to track down those lost sheep and bring them back to the church. That's why we as Catholics, and I don't know um, uh, if all Catholics are practicing this way, but I've had Protestants tell me, you, you Catholics are really judgmental in saying we are damned because we don't belong to the Catholic Church. We are saying your church is damned because it's not Christ's church, so it cannot be of truth. We never take the position of judging the individual. We leave that to Christ because in his mercy, he's always going out to bring the lost sheep back. And we as Catholics have to do much the same. So we have to um, seek out the non-Catholics because we know um, all non-Catholics originally somewhere in their ancestry were Catholics, so they became lost sheep. And so rather than judging them, we are trying to show a mercy and grace to bring them back into Christ's church. This isn't an act of them agreeing with us, right? That would be arrogant of us. We're saying we know Christ is the truth and therefore there is only one true church. And so we want them back into Christ's church, right? And so what did Christ say? Uh, to his apostles, the, the beginning of his church. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I, Jesus, the Son of the living God, I, the infinite wisdom, the eternal truth, and with you all the days, even until the end of the world. In other words, as I said in the previous episode, his church will last until end times, right? So what is Christ doing? He's, he's solemnly promised that he will send the church the spirit of truth, who shall teach truth forever. Therefore, uh, has never been a single error in the Church of Christ, or Christ has failed us in his promise, right? So, so could Christ command us to believe the Church if the Church could lead us astray and lead us into error? If, if the teachings of the Church are corrupt, as our Protestant friends say, could Christ, uh, who is... God of truth, command us without any restriction or limitation to hear and believe the teachings of the church which he established if it was false. So what did Christ say to his followers, the apostles, at the beginning of the church? He that heareth you heareth me, and that despiseth you despiseth me. Right? Very very specific, right? So if we believe what uh, Christ church teaches, we believe him. And contrary what we do, if we do not believe in the teachings of his church, we do not believe in him, right? And uh, the Protestants are very big on St. Paul. They, they love St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul said the church is the ground and the pillar of the truth. So the moment we take uh, away this authority of Christ's church, we fall into all kinds of errors and what I would say blasphemous doctrines, right? So how did this originally start? Well, in the 16th century or the 1500s, uh, Protestantism uh, did away with the authority of the church and then constituted that every man be his own judge through the Bible and, and then we have to say, at what consequence did Martin Luther say this, right? Well, St. Paul said, Though we apostles, or even an angel of light, were to come and preach to you a different gospel from what was preached, let him be an anathema. Now, this word has been used quite a lot uh, by popes throughout our church history. And anathema is... Uh, is this formal excommunication uh, from Christ's church, 
Right. So for St. Paul to use those heavy words, I say it to the Protestants who have such a great devotion in the writings of St. Paul, heed his words, right? Um, so if we go back uh, to the original departure, of course, it's Martin Luther. And then after Martin Luther uh, came John Calvin, who started the Presbyterians, right? Then after him came King Henry VIII with the Anglicans. Then after that came the Episcopalians. Then the Methodists, which were, uh, were originally Episcopalians, broke away uh, with the works of John Wesley to form the Methodist Church, right? Now, if you notice this, these are all man's formations. Not one of them is Christ. They're men who decided they knew better and formed their own churches. But if we, if we read the, the words, uh, Christ said, But he that is, is an hireling and not the shepherd, who own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Okay, It's almost like he's foretelling all these founders of these man-made faiths, right? So what I like to say to all non-Catholic and my Protestant friends is be very careful with this form of emotionalism that has be cre been created by these men that has infected the true church or the true faith. Because what do we know? That the truth is never emotional, right? The truth is always the truth. And as the Holy Ghost can only be one truth, right? And not a single additional truth. There's not a contradicting truth. Um, you have to almost move away from these emotional truths that the Protestant church created when they have so many different uh, sects, these 33 different churches that are created. And just follow the one good shepherd and his true holy Catholic apostolic church because on the day of your judgment, you'll be standing before Christ. Martin Luther isn't going to be riding shotgun with you, standing next to you. Only you and Christ. And not to presuppose your judgment or what Christ would say to you, but I'd like to think he would say, I am the good shepherd, not Martin Luther, right? I am the good shepherd, not John Wellesley. Um, I am the good shepherd, not Campbell who was yet another church founded out of Protestantism. And if, if you want to be true to yourself, try to first be true to Christ, right? Uh, take, a, take a pause for a minute. And I've said this in previous episodes. Take the faith that you're following that is not the Catholic faith, put it aside for a second, and go back and learn the faith of the Catholic Church learn its dogma, right? Learn its theology, learn its catechism, and, and be a student of the Catholic faith. And I, I hate to say your ancestors, if you were born into Protestant, probably didn't know their faith to begin with. And so when the wolf came, it was easy to, to take them away as sheep, okay? To truly know the Catholic faith is a tough, journey. You have to become a student. Now, many Protestants will say, well, that's not the way Christ was. He didn't expect everyone to be so educated. He wanted them to just open the Bible and get the truth and stop all this hierarchy. If that is true, he would have never set up the church the way he did. He would simply have said, okay, I died for your sins. Uh, so since I died for all possible sins man can ever create, you have no need to earn your salvation. You have no need to follow any church. Just, just go out and uh, if you feel you're, uh, you're born again uh, and I, I, Christ, have died for all your sins and there's no earning of salvation, we're all good here. There would be no need for him to establish a church at all. Right? So... Be practical. If Christ was the one to set up the church and Christ was the one to institute the hierarchy of the church, which he did by saying to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, 
okay? What you hold bound is held bound. He wouldn't have said that. He would have said, Peter, since you are born again in me, and since I will die for all of you, go back to your family, keep fishing, uh, and when you die, we're all good here. Never said that. Never. He, he sent his apostles out to convert, right? Now, if a Protestant is true to what they believe, and they say, we don't need the church to help us earn our salvation, then take it to the extreme. Then the Buddhists, the Hinduists, the Muslims, uh, Christ died for them too, right? So he died on the cross for all their sins. There is no reason they need to convert to uh, Christianity or, or Catholicism. Everything's good. They can just go on as good Hindus or Muslims, and because Christ died for them, they're already saved. We know that can't be the case, right? Why would Christ have sent his apostles out to convert? And the church has always been a church of conversion, converted all of Europe, right, from paganism, converted any human being they came across, even to the point of uh, significant martyrdom, like the Jesuits that all went to their martyrdom in Japan, right? Were all these martyrs unnecessary martyrs? Did they die for something that was never meant to die for? I mean, Christ saved everyone, so why did they even go out and waste their time? Why did St. Paul have to go through all the rigors he said he went through? The, the near drownings, the shipwrecks, the near deaths, the near hangings, because everybody was already saved? And therefore, there is no reason to follow the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. See, it never stands up. And, and I don't mean to be arrogant. But Protestants always come in halfway into the story. And especially today, if, you, if we say up to 1,500 years, um, well, you know, they basically came in even further than halfway into the story, right? And they recreate the story to serve their narrative. And in order to be part of Christ's church, the Catholic church, you have to work very hard. It's not an easy faith to belong to. And I'd like to say that Martin Luther knew that. He was a well-trained Augustinian priest. And I think he was worn out with it and thought, boy, it's got to be easier. There's got to be an easier way, right? And so what he did is he watered it down and he stole as many sheep as he could and he became a false shepherd. And now, uh, since the time of the 1500s, look at all the souls he has stolen from the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. And you as Protestants need to stop that cycle. You need to get back you need to learn the faith. You need to do a deep dive. You have a lot of learning to do, especially if you were born into the Protestant faith. You have to go back to the dogma, and you have to learn it. You have to be students. And please, when you go through your conversion, try not to get it all done in lightning speed. I mean, for me, I was brought up in the faith, and I'm still learning my faith. Right? So I never profess to be a, a perfect Catholic. I make big mistakes and I'm corrected along the way, which requires me to do what? To read more, to learn more, right? To find a good holy priest. Now, here's something that is a little concerning to me, especially in the state of our current Catholic Church, which is going through a lot of liberalism, humanism, and potential error. It's very difficult for a convert to come to the Catholic Church without doing significant research on the priest that they're choosing to guide them in their conversion. And I'm not saying I know everything, but if you, if you have any intention of converting, feel free to email you. I'd like to line you up with a priest that is, is teaching the true traditional Catholic faith, the one holy apostolic faith, and not the watered-down faith of Vatican II that has been so infected with ecumenism 
and this Protestant-like um, injection, right? So we as uh, Catholics born into the church not only need to defend the one holy Catholic church, but we have to make sure that we ourselves have not been led astray within our own church by these hirelings, okay? So God bless you on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Uh, double down on this. Just, you can ignore everything I have to say other than don't ignore Christ and go back and learn the teachings of his true church. Okay? God bless, and I hope this helps. Hope I don't come off arrogant, because I don't mean to.